that works too because we can do this here and i'd like to thank everybody for for showing for showing up today and quite honestly i would say the real reason is because of how much time we're all spending um online these days so i have a quick question here um how many people here are are educators or teachers Raise hand, raise hand, yes. <laughs> and, and I've been asked to sit down. Sitting down is not my normal um, in a presentation or anything like this. But. <laughs> yeah, like for the but, sake of the stream. Yeah, for the sake of the stream, I will sit. <laughs> <laughs> but for uh, people who have, uh, for people who are teachers, um, were you required to teach over Zoom? And and gentle, uh, gentle hair and educator, I use educator broadly, and I see jazz is. He's saying yes. I, I'm, I'm just, and, and we haven't even gotten started yet, but I'm just asking how many people were teaching over Zoom? And you might have been required to teach over Zoom, or it might have been that that was the best option for you. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was wondering about. And and I, and I'm seeing and I'm seeing people. Oh, Florian, Zoom and WebEx. Yes, I I was also required to do WebEx. Oh, Max, Blackboard Collaborate. Mm -hmm. Lear, yeah, Lear. I know where you were where you were teaching through WebEx. Because <laughs> because we were probably it was probably in the same system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the app as well as the desktop. Not loving either. <laughs> but it looks like it, it's about time to get started. So we'll, we'll go ahead to get started. Um, and uh, I think the live stream should be starting pretty soon. So Chris, feel free to go ahead. Sure. I think we are all ready to go. Looks like it is 10 o'clock. Uh, so to uh, ease those uh, folks uh, for uh, chat, we have gone ahead and put the slides and a uh, the presentation script at the bit.ly there. Uh, so you can feel free to access that and uh, as you desire. So uh, hello and welcome. We're going to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic and remote learning has opened a pathway for more educators to visit the metaverse and its many worlds and environments. It's kind of the, the whole basis of why we're here and, and our presentation. And these are observations that uh, Kay and I have, have observed over the, uh, the past year, year plus uh, as uh, we've made changes. So we'll talk a little bit about why we picked dystopic. So this is one definition uh, that's out there. And, and, and really, and may, may I interrupt for just a second? <laughs> sure. I, I, I like to give you a little context. Okay, so so what we're doing here at Virtual World's Best Practices um, is actually an extension of a talk that we gave over at the OpenSim conference. And the OpenSim conference, um, we only slotted ourselves for um, twenty minutes, and it really. And 20 minutes was not long enough to talk about this. And the reason why Lear just typed hee hee in the chat is because <laughs> is because 20 minutes was not long enough. So we're bringing you what we discussed there. So if anybody was there, you'll see some similarities. And also, we, we, want, we want you to discuss. Um, put things in chat, ideas. Um, we have no problem. We we have no problem with you know reading chat and and talking <laughs> and and um and the thing about it is while it's a presentation you can certainly see our slides and you can certainly look at the 
look at the links and things like that. But we're we're more interested in um, tossing some of the ideas out and also getting your thoughts on it. So I, I'm now going to give it <laughs> since I've interrupted Chris, I'm going to now give it give it back to him. Um, but I just wanted to set the context. Okay, thanks. Yes, definitely. Feel free to to chat. Feel free to type questions or type your favorites in response to some of the things we're we're going to be talking about. So, uh, why dystopia? Well, well, the key here is it's a vision of the future. It's a way to think differently. It's a way to see uh, possibly even inspiring action. And uh, somebody ask you, well, well, how how might dystopian fiction apply to 2020? <laughs> Some of you may have already made that connection. Uh, others yeah, uh, will, say, will walk I, you I along. Don't have, <laughs> I don't think we have to. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have exactly. to explain it anymore. Okay. <laughs> so 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 the next slide might sound things might sound eerily uh, familiar on the next slide. Next slide about characteristics of dystopian genres. Government control, technology control, environmental disaster, survival, a focus on survival, loss of individualism. I think this picture, uh, the gentleman in this picture, sums up a lot of our feelings about 2021. Uh, I should say about 2020. And, uh, <laughs> and the other thing we have here is, these are some other examples of dystopia literature. So, See any there anyone any of this look familiar to you folks? <laughs> so we have Ready Player One, we have Ender's Game, Altered Carbon, Snow Crash. I'm sure that what are some of your favorites? Feel free to type in your favorite titles. Uh Oh, Ready Player Two, Beth. Um I've been thank you for mentioning Ready Player Two because I I have not, I've purposely not read it yet, and I'm getting feedback. Yeah, I've been looking at Ministry uh, for, of the Future. From people Thanks. about it. And and I think it's good. And and I we, we, do, we do book clubs, so I think it's going to make an interesting book club, but not in the way that Ready Player One was a book club. Uh, yeah, Jay, it, it came out not to, a, not to a lot of fanfare. It, it came out, it, it came out. And like I said, I've been getting feedback from people. Um, and the way to think about, I guess the way to think, of it, what I've been, the feedback that, I get, that I'm hearing is that it's, it's different than Ready Player One. But yes, Ministry of the Future, I've been looking at that one. It's like when I have free time. Uh, <laughs> and also, speaking of, of uh, Snow Crash, uh, we're actually going to be doing a quick, uh, doing a book club. And here's the details. <laughs> it's also on the script as well, so you don't and, need to copy and, and And the context for this one is that when we were, we were, ta when we were talking about this this title and and seriously let let's let's you know let's go ahead and, and and make sure that that we connect it what we're really saying here is we think that these times are an opportunity to show people again what can be done in the metaverse in the metaverse in virtual worlds and that's really why i was doing that warm up asking everybody about zoom and um, this slide we have up here, this also came out of the Open Sim um, conference, and and Buffy, <laughs> I, I believe it was Buffy, um, when we started talking about Snow Crash, and Buffy was the one who suggested that um, Mega Game Book Club, the book club we do, get with um, Valerie Hill, <laughs> Val Librarian, and um, the Community Virtual Library. And because of that, this is also built up. Starting next week, we are going to be doing a book club, and you're all invited. Um, we're going to be doing a book club where we're rereading No Crash. And I, I will just put out there that we'll, we'll be having more discussions there about, um, about how do we bring people in the metaverse? What are the attributes of the metaverse? What, what components of the metaverse we should be going ahead and... Um, 
highlighting for people. So all of you, you're more than welcome to come to it. Thank you for that oh. link, Tamo. Thank you very yeah. much. And please, if anybody else has other links, please go ahead. So a little side by side we have here <laughs> is is definitely 2020. We had lots of city and state uh, mandates uh, across the world. Uh, we definitely had desperate access to technology. Uh, we also had a environmental disaster uh, called COVID uh, 19 and uh, a pandemic. Uh, there's lots of messaging about surviving. You know, what color is your county, your country? Um, here in the U.S., they like the, we like to put color codes on things. Uh, and then another thing you see is you also have lots of, you know, we've seen plenty, plenty of prime examples of uh, rugged American individualism uh, and, and how some feel that that, that has been lost uh, given the, the various city and state mandates. So, so for us, it, it looked like it sort of uh, lined up as well. Uh, looking and seeing as far as, okay, so we're seeing that we're probably in our own little dystopia here, our own little microverse or alternate reality uh, that's out there. So the next slide is, is, is then we saw, okay, so we have all these things going on. So what has been our solution to this dystopic reality? And that led us to this question. <laughs> is this the oasis uh, that was described in Ready Player One? <laughs> For those that you have read it, <laughs> yeah, there's a few no's, yes. <laughs> and so that's really sort of a lot of our our colleges, a lot of our educational systems shifted to Zoom or other platforms. But primarily, the biggest one that's getting lots of uh, coverage is Zoom. There's also we talked about uh, Blackboard Collaborate. WebEx, uh, Discord have been on, uh, old you know, Google Hangout used to have it. Some people are still using uh, the Google Messenger or chat features that are there. There's lots of different variety of software and tools, but a lot of them sort of stop short of jumping off. Now, this was a great solution whenever we're all rapidly switching to online, but it's also led to something called Zoom fatigue. Uh, so any Zoom fatiguers here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you, I, I'm in a doctoral program, and last night, the professor, the, the, prof the professor said, "Everybody, please turn your cameras back on." <laughs> he's, like, he's like, "I don't want." I, I don't want to be looking to looking at these blank squares with your names on them. And and I mean, I know what he's going through because he's not he's not used to um it's actually it's actually a class in labor studies. So um worker rights. So he was a a union organizer, so he's very used to the face to face. So I know what he was going through, but it, also at the same time, um, just in my head, because I critique every class I'm in, I was thinking, you don't know what your students are going through, your students. I know you want to see the students' faces, but your students have to look at their faces for the whole time that, that, that they're on camera. Well, not only a warning, but also a check your background uh, for uh, when people to turn uh, their cameras on. <laughs> Yeah, are there things in your background you don't want the public to know, to know about? Uh, but the thing is, is when we're looking at this, is you're looking at Zoom fatigue, you're looking at there. But the other question is, is Zoom fatigue also part of a desire for more, desire to want to have a different environment to do learning that gives you more ability or more capacity than what video conferencing does? And uh, we'll go ahead and turn that over to Kay, and Kay will... Uh, so it is something I'm sure you, I'm sure most of us here are very familiar with virtual worlds. Okay, I'm going to just make a comment because I, I, I was reading what Eilictic put about, you know, liking Second Life and and, and liking the phone better. Um, how many how many people here have gone into um, gone into Clubhouse? 
So it, I, I'm a gamer, so feel free to just type why if it's yes or no, <laughs> you know, and oh, Eric, I am a droid person too. <laughs> that is my problem. Okay, what Clubhouse is, and it's been out for a year now, but Clubhouse is this very exclusive, <laughs> it's this very exclusive app because it's only, you can only do it on the iPhone. You can't do it on iPad, I already checked. Um, and you have to be invited to it. It's in beta. They are doing a wonderful job at marketing as exclusive, but basically what it's like, um, it's, it's, a, it's a chat room. Okay, but it's audio only. So it's not like it's not like Voxer, which you can go back in and, and you know, like hear the messages. Um, Clubhouse is a synchronous audio. And you don't have to worry about, you know, getting on camera. <laughs> and and Mal, yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for it too. <laughs> And Marie just put that you need to know someone. Exactly, because invites are few and far between. But I just wanted to throw that out there, that Zoom fatigue is real. And I think it's, it's what's making Clubhouse, besides the exclusiveness, so popular. But again, it's something with us in virtual worlds. We can have an avatar representation. We can make decisions like, like now, <laughs> we can make decisions on are the lips of our avatar going to be moving or not? Um, how, how much expressions are we gonna actually do in their scripts and, and there's choices so that we aren't constantly being fatigued by having to be on camera, having, having to see ourselves on camera, <laughs> have it, having that delayed response that happens with Zoom so that, it, that it's not automatic and it's one of the great things about virtual worlds. And I just uh, threw this slide up. This is a slide that we use when we, we talk to people who don't do virtual worlds, you know, to explain it to them. So um, here's my question for you. Um, how, you know, like, how many virtual worlds is everybody going into these days? <laughs> and Edith, I would love to see you on camera. Don't think that, but I, I, I totally understand. <laughs> So um, go ahead and type in chat what virtual <laughs> Edith, yeah, I would not, I will tell you, I would not mind at least. So go ahead and type which um, virtual world you go into. Um, for me, it's Second Life. Mozilla Hubs. Open soon. And the next one. Oh, Eric Powell is back in the day. Yes, a call out to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> IMVU, I still get advertisements for IMVU, and I have a friend who goes in there all the time. Oh, Verabella, Bill, thank you for mentioning that. Um, <laughs> I did not type that in as as the one I've been going into because I've been I've been going in less frequently, but you'll see it um, soon. Yes, thank you, thank you for sharing all, all of these. Um, VR chat count, uh, yeah, VR chat does count because we'll have it up here. Um, 3D web worlds, thank you, Lear, and 3D web worlds. That's a shout out to Day Miami whenever I see that. Sansar. Yeah, all space. So this is a group of people. We're going into a lot of virtual worlds. I, I'm gonna, um, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss it in one other one that I'm hearing discussed. That I'm hearing discussed, and it's actually with librarians. So shout out to you, Beth. Um, Animal Crossing. Yes, Animal Crossing. In fact, um, I teach a multi-graphic design class and it's one of the options I give. I, okay, so it's, it's, it's like you can do like Photoshop like things in there. So it's one of the, for an assignment, it's one of the options I give my students. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, an- Animal Crossing, um, I would say during this pandemic, this it has become big with the, and, and I, I will tell you adults too, but um, the tween set, and I've had discussions with librarians um, about um, using it for activities in libraries. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're always looking at things, and and also um, the slide that advocates just put up here is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, World of Warcraft. It's enough of a virtual world for me, um, and. And quite honestly, the reason is while I go in game, um, I do a lot of the hanging out and talking with other people, including um, including including talking about educational things. Yeah, I I think Animal Crossing, while the tweens uh, the tweens found it, I also I also think that that there's some there's been some crossover. And and Eric. Um, as far as as exploring the world of WoW more than the gameplay itself, yeah, sometimes the design is fantastic, and sometimes you know you just look at you, you just look at things and you go, oh, that texture is just awful. <laughs> and and there's a dungeon that I run with my friends, with some of them are here, and there's this one dungeon and we just go, oh, that texture is just awful. They really should have fixed that texture. <laughs> and, and Leah, um, while you can you can now go in and play free uh, up to level twenty, so there are things that you can run around and go take a look if you felt like it. But totally fine if you don't. Okay, I I will continue. <laughs> I, I I will continue on. But basically, I've been seeing more people go back into virtual worlds now than say 2018 2019 and and think and things like that and so so for for example um some people mentioned virabella um and the immersive the immersive um, learning conference did virabella this year and i took a screenshot of it this is what it looked like so it was basically slides um, and Zoom, and you see the cutouts of people. And I will tell you, there were a lot of people there who had never been in a virtual world before. And they were floored by the fact that a conference could look like that. And that conference, I, I'm sorry, when it comes to immersiveness, when it, when it comes to what could be built and what could be shown, did not, did not compare with, with what's happening right here. And and for, for example, um, you can see my seven foot, you know, my avatar, my seven foot cyber goth, you know, with my Russian caustic outfit <laughs> and my blue hair and, and my really full, beautiful blue hair here um, compared to this was about the best I could make my I could make my avatar look like in Virabella. And 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 yeah, body shape wise, there there were no options. Okay, <laughs> there there were not no options other than other than that. And choices are limited. But despite that, you know, um, the immersive learning conference had a huge had thousands of people coming to it, and thousands of people who again were floored by something that was very simple. Very simple compared to what we did, and it. <laughs> and Murray, yes, a gateway drug. Oh, Bill, thank you for sharing that. And and let me tell you, I'm not mo- I'm not knocking or mocking the immersive learning conference. Um, I would say, it's 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 a it's a way for people to learn about this, and it's also a way for people to learn about how things could even be more immersive. And so, Chris. Go ahead, hit the next slide, and I will tell you that that even in Virabella, there was there was the ability to have some whimsy. Um, I was just going to ask, um, how many people have been to have been into Virabella? Mm-hmm. Yes, I am a PhD student. Finally, yeah, that's why. Okay. 
did and um, I was going to say, did anybody go to the immersive learning conference? Okay, cool. Lurked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. And I was going to say, I was going to say that, look, um, you know, there were, they, even, even though the space, you know, you couldn't um, necessarily build as easily a, a space like we're in right now, um, you can have some, there's some fun and whimsy there. Now, did anybody go into that room, into the void? And, and Agile Bill, a good balance or a sweet spot? Yeah. And I mean, the, the, whole, the whole purpose of, a, of us really talking today is that everybody here is, should, is pretty much a veteran of virtual worlds. And if we need to use a gateway drug, if we need, have to call it a sweet spot, if we have to call it a compromise, this is a good way to take, to take people. Oh, Tamu, you that you share a second life in, in Zoom. I do too. And and I think and I think sharing second life in Zoom is is a great option. And I have had student not only students but like colleagues pay attention when I never could have gotten them in world. And and yeah, how do we blend technologies with students who have ha, have low bandwidth and what is and what is the best practice um for me when we could go on campus it used to be making sure that there was a space on campus that they could go to um now that we have you know now that everybody went remote i do for me at least i do options so where i've been putting them is um mozilla hubs just because it's a bit easier. And again, it's a compromise and it's a bit of a, gate, a gateway. And I should say, I shouldn't say Loom, I should say Zoom. And I and um, I apologize for my accent and, and, and how in my accent, and how my accent comes out when I'm excited and, and, and when it's something that I'm interested in. Yeah, jazz. Thank you, thank you for that. Oh, okay, Edith. I, 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 thought you, I thought you were talking about my accent. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I've been finding out the, the longer that I, I'm online, um, that my accent comes out more. But thank you. <laughs> okay. But what I, what I wanted to say with this picture, at least, if you went to the iLearn conference, did you see the room that said "Into the Void"? Did anybody else see the room that said into the void? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I was gonna tell you that that this was really fun and I I have to applaud the builders here. Okay. It it was it by all the conference rooms and then it said into the void. Okay. Um you open the door and then you go, you open the door and go in. Okay. Now, the cool thing about this, um, you go into the void, it's completely black. Yeah, Edith, it was for me, me only. I was the only one who saw it, right? <laughs> but what I'm going to say is, I had this discussion with Lear before. Okay, Lear saw the void too, so I know it wasn't just me, okay? Okay, you went into the void, <laughs> and it was completely black. It was completely dark, completely black there. Okay, now... The thing of it is, you couldn't walk back out. So you went into the void, and then you couldn't walk back out. You had to log out and log back in to get out of the void. And I just wanted to say, for Vera, Vera Bella, which seems like, which seems like very, very business-like, okay, that little piece of whimsy was wonderful. That little piece of whimsy that said walk into the void, that little exploration option for people was what I think virtual worlds are all about. That, that you had the possibility, uh, despite everything trying to be like a, a twin 
of, of what you would see at a university or mirroring what you would see at a university. And I know we see that in Second Life and other virtual worlds a lot too, but I thought it was absolutely wonderful that that little bit of whimsy, that little bit of not possible in real life was there. One of the key factors that make virtual worlds fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Chris, you can go ahead and put it, if you feel like it, you can go ahead and make the, you can even link the little video that, that we made when we first, um, um, you know, like, like we went to, went to Virabella. We just wanted to show some people what Virabella was like, so we, we did like a quick, like, it was a hangout or Camtasia, I don't know, it was something. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so. I know that uh, preaching to the choir, whether we're here in Second Life or VWBPE or the open simulators, but I really believe, and and I and I and I'm seeing it, <laughs> and I'm seeing it in chat too, with Jazz and Tamu and others, um, that the time is right for us to show people virtual worlds for the first time, and also to bring those veterans and those people who were in virtual worlds before to, to bring them back. And as Tamu was asking the question about what is the best practice, well, maybe we bring them back slowly. And I found slow, <laughs> okay? And, and I have used slow with my students. And my slow um, is Mozilla Hubs. Mozilla Hubs is, you know, it. It's not Second Life. It's not Open Sim. It's limited, but the limited parts of it allow you to do things. And I just did this simply to put up what you would consider like poster exhibitions for my students, so that my that my students who had low bandwidth were able to get into a virtual space um, that has proximity. And that was one of the concepts I wanted to teach them was proximity, that that they that um, audio that audio um, faded or or came across depending on the proximity, and that things could be up there, and there and that there was another way of conceptualizing this. Ah, and Jazz. <laughs> I love what Jazz just put in uh, in the chat that said, um, talking about avatar design. Yeah, avatar design means a lot. And and Vera uh, Bella is limited is limited um, avatar design. So when it, when it comes to what you're bringing students in to, I think quite honestly, I I. I can bring my students into Mozilla Hubs or Alt VR. They're community college students. Okay, they don't have a lot of options with the avatar, but um, I think that Virabella is better for <laughs> for people who are less whimsical, <laughs> and perhaps um, for for people who are very business uh, for very business. I would say business courses and people who are very business like. So for administrators. Hmm, Marie, great. Great that, that you do Virabella and Mozilla Hubs. And that's what I think we can do. I think what I think we can do is we can show lots of different options. And the other thing is we can now have discussions because everybody knows what Zoom is like. <laughs> <laughs> and we can have discussions about why seeing a talking head isn't the best thing. And um, just threw that picture up that's up there now on Mozilla Hubs. I was just going to say I just I just threw that up there so that you can have an idea. There's a tutorial there, um, and we'll get into this a little bit later also. But Mozilla Hubs, if you are building and scripting in Second Life, 
Mozilla Hobbs is not difficult for you. And, and I will tell you the first place I scripted and built was here in Second Life. And the skills I learned here, I have taken to um, other virtual worlds and to other game engines. So I'm thinking there's some really transferable skills that we can start talking about with students. And Marie spoke is pretty easy. Yes, exactly. Um, Edith going, will it persist beyond the pandemic? I don't know, but this is a critical juncture. This is our opportunity. This is it. this is us showing that there's things beyond Zoom. There's buildings. Um, the other discussion you have is where where were students and kids when they weren't um, when they weren't in the classroom? They were they were playing games online with their friends. And Ian's bringing out uh, Minecraft and James. Um, yes, the, there is a question about persistence. That's why for me, Mozilla Hubs is just something to begin with and then to go and, and then to go further. Okay, and then of course, and just had to put it in here because we all know this, this is Second Life. <laughs> we know what here, what we can do in Second Life and you know, Chris asked the question about, is this the oasis that people were thinking about? This is this is our build from like, I think it was 2018 or 2019 for VWVPE. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the oasis that, that we were thinking about. Now, I'd like to talk to you about a trend. And it wasn't something that I saw anybody put in chat. So I'll ask you about it. Is anybody here um, playing Fortnite? Sometimes. Oh, and I did see Second Life has a negative reputation among educators. Um, Edith, I would say, yeah, if they remember it. <laughs> There's a lot of new educators out there. <laughs> There's a lot of new educators <laughs> who do not know Second Life. <laughs> and that's who I think we can really be. <laughs> thinking too. <laughs> so 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 those are people we can talk to, and then and then the other people that we the people who know Second Life and think a, a negative opinion, you know, just bring them soon. And Marie, thank you thank you for putting that for st a statistic. Okay, so the thing about um, Fortnite, did you know that that Fortnite. Uh, I, I'm just going to go with a little trivia. Do you know that Fortnite, uh, when it was built, they didn't think it would be a really, uh, they didn't build it to build like the most popular, the most popular game. Okay. Fortnite was built to showcase the game engine. And the game engine is called Unreal Engine. Okay. Um, how many people here have, um, gone into Unity to build? And you can type yes, no. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, the thing, about, uh, the thing about Unity, Unity, <laughs> Unity and Unreal Engine are like, <laughs> are like iPhones and droids, okay? So, these are these right now are the two competing and for for I'm just gonna call them game engines. And they know they are competing, okay? <laughs> they they uh, before anybody really knew what Fortnite was, they knew that they that that they were competing. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine, okay, so Unity um, they noticed the educational market, I would say, in about 2016, 2017. And that's when they started really reaching out to educators and trying to get educators to use Unity. And getting, I, I should say, getting educators who taught computer science, who taught game development, who taught multimedia, they tried to get them to use Unity. And they gave free versions. Okay, now Unreal Engine, in about the last year, year and a half or so, uh, they're also doing that. Okay. Oh, Eric. Eric, 
tell us more, put us links, <laughs> you know, give us links in here, please, please share. But the thing about it is what Unreal Engine is doing well, and I say we use it, is Unreal Engine is doing a good job right now of doing outreach to educators, doing tutorials. Um, my suggestion is to, when, whenever a technology um, is starting to ramp up, there's there are some people who seem to be corporate, you know, almost become corporate chills. I would say kind of ignore them, but take a look at what Unreal Engine has put out. This Creator's Field Guide to Emerging Careers in Interactive 3D, link it for your students. Start talking about it because um, I'm gonna on this next slide. I'm I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you something. Well, that was while Unreal Engine has the Creator's Field Guide to Emerging Careers in Interactive 3D. This just came out in November. Okay, this is something. Um, my colleague slash, okay, all of my colleagues are my friends. Okay, so I'm just going to say my friends. So my friends and I, for the past five years, now this is an, this is an article from 2016, um, and it's from Fast Company, and it was about the design jobs of the future. I will tell you, we walked around for months and maybe even a year going, how are we going to teach our students so that they can do this? <laughs> yes, and Leah, I will tell you, I have a microbiology um, professor. This is, this, is, this is not out of the realm, even in 2016. This is in the classes. We, in the classes, our biology classes, our anatomy and physiology, and our microbiology classes, we are using biomimicry um, as our topic to get our students to think about this. Human, human organ design is happening. Um, it's mainly at the research universities and PhD levels, but we want our students to be able to be creative, technical, and divergent thinkers who, when they see human organ designer, they go, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. We want them to go, I could be a fusionist. I could be a, an embodied interaction designer. And the last one, the Uber driver, that's like a little like joke that Fast Company added at the end. So not just the STEM jobs. I'd, I'd say STEAM jobs because you need art there. You need creativity. You need, and, and, and this is actually something that, that we're doing research on, um, is you need divergent thinking. And virtual worlds, building in places like this, allow for divergent thinking. And so while Unreal Engine is very nice about the 3D careers, we, we even want to go further. <laughs> yeah, Lear, an organ design for me needs a sense of humor. Absolutely. Edith, music? Yes. So another reason to bring your students in here is for divergent thinking, is so that they can do things that are not possible in real life, and they can consider them, and they can take them back and think about how they could possibly <laughs> do things <laughs> in real life. Okay, so um, Chris, I think you're gonna, and so um, the other thing I was gonna say before we give it to Chris is Unreal Engine is doing a lot of tutorials and has these tutorials and courses up. I know we are lifelong learners here. You can go take a look at them and then think about, are you gonna have your students not only play in Fortnite, but also use Unreal Engine to build things. And you, and Agile, Bill, yeah, Unity has good training too. Like I said, they're pretty much like, you know, like the iPhone and Android. <laughs> so I'd say, look, at, look at, at both of them. Look at both of them. And there are things that 
like I said, there are things that, that I learned initially here in Second Life with scripting and building that has allowed me to go, to go way beyond that. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and he, he's going to talk to you about another trend. And, <laughs> and I would say just go ahead and listen to this. <laughs> Exactly. I'll say, yes, there's there's lots of options now for game engines. You're starting to see more and more of them uh, that are out there. So the biggest thing is just find one you like, find one interface that works for you and your students, and then go with it. There's no really right or wrong with it. Uh, there's lots of options. And, and as we know, as us, as us veteran uh, second lifers know, it's always good to have backups. <laughs> so that's not, not a bad thing to be versed in multiple platforms. Uh, and so speaking of a platform, this is Roblox. So uh, hopefully, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Heard of Roblox. Uh, they've been in the news lately a lot. Uh, they uh, do a lot of things. It's very much a, a Lego world, uh, if you will. The avatars have a lot in common with little Lego uh, characters. And uh, it's a game development platform. It allows you to design a variety of different games. And it is geared towards a younger crowd, but anybody can use it. Uh, it's being used uh, in a wide variety of different areas uh, in education, uh, from primary, secondary, and uh, post-secondary as well. Uh, they also, just like Unity and Unreal Engine, uh, have pushed a lot heavily into education. And like Minecraft, following the, the sort of the, the the flow of Minecraft into the educational world, really putting in a lot of resources and uh, going ahead and trying to get more educators to use them. And also they've done a lot of funding uh, going out to support all of this push. So in summer 2019, they had over a million users, uh, sorry, 100 million users using Roblox uh, and doing things on there. The other interesting thing from Roblox is they also allow uh, creators to charge uh, users to play their games, and so there is an entrepreneurial business aspect to it that uh, you can get into and use it. So it's just beyond just normal design classes or coding classes. It starts getting into uh, a lot of the business side of and and sort of looking at how do you create uh, pay to play. So there's lots of different things to see there. Uh, and also in uh, February of 2020, they raised 150 million funding, and then. In January 21, they raised an additional $520 million in funding. So they've got a war chest now that they've really sort of been investing in how did they grow this market and how do they grow and get people ahead and platform. So Roblox is something that's definitely going to be coming to you if you don't already see it. Um, and there's a couple of different articles in the script that we have as far as like why Minecraft and Roblox are on the uh, fall syllabus chat here. Uh, and there's lots of things that um, see here. And then also they have a list of other education institutions because as an administrator, I can tell you, my fellow administrators like to see that somebody else is doing this besides just you. Uh, so if you're pitching this to your administrators, uh, this, this, the Roblox actually helpfully provides you with a list of other institutions that are using their platform and education aspects uh, that you can follow up. So there's, yeah, <laughs> monopolize the metaverse. Who knows? Uh, that's really sort of been a big push, uh, a big growth area for them that they're looking to expand into education and the pandemic, like most of these platforms, have provided the opportunity uh, and getting looking for people to look more than just video conferencing and doing something more. Uh, in addition to just what we're seeing here in virtual worlds and desktop worlds, of course, we can't, we cannot talk about virtual reality. Uh, that's there. And, uh, again, uh, most of you, I think, are probably familiar with virtual reality. Uh, but just in case, here's the, here's the definition we give to folks, uh, who uh, are going ahead and have not, are not familiar with it. And of course, is this really the gargoyle you see in Star Crash? Uh, <laughs> it's a lot less, it's more streamlined. Uh, not the model, the actual equipment itself. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, you have the different VR and you have the different pieces there as far as how are we trying to do different things? 
Uh, or is this the, the gargoyle that we were looking for? And of course, you know, this is there is Oculus and there's Vive uh, pieces uh, are the two platforms we saw there. And and that's really sort of another space folks are looking at. And we talked about a little bit earlier about Virbella and how they actually provide. You can actually they actually have a VR option. You can actually go into VR. You can actually go into Virbella using a, a VR set as opposed to going in just on your desktop. Uh, and so there's there's these different options as we're looking at how do we go ahead and use it. Um, one of the challenges we run into, of course, is is cost uh, when it comes to how do we go ahead and and get this, especially here at a community college, um, how do we go ahead and get products that our students can have access to and can afford uh, and that we can afford as well. So one possible way to look at is uh, Altspace VR is one of the other options that are out there. It allows you to go in. If you have the headset, you can go in. If you do not, you can still access it via the browser. And also a lot of the platforms we talked about earlier are also have the capacity now to easily take your builds from Unity and from Unreal and then export them into a VR format as well. Uh, exactly. It's it's figuring out how to get the, the figuring out those pieces, especially now. Yeah, exactly. Rihanna is talking about especially now in today's current environment is how do we go ahead and make sure that everyone has access to that. I'll go ahead and turn it to Kay to wrap it up since we are rapidly approaching our, our, our the end of our presentation. And I can I can talk faster than him. Okay, I'm just throwing this up here. We will move quickly. I will tell you, I don't have to use this with people at VWBP. <laughs> okay, but I will tell you, um, for people outside of VWBP, um, in especially instructional designers, I will go to uh, virtual worlds as being the informal learning space that students are not having because they're only doing remote. And, and the and these were just some of the things. <laughs> so so this is what we normally use um, since we are wrapping it up because it is time. Um, we'd like to invite you. Um, we are doing um, a book club, and we're doing a book club with <laughs> the community virtual library. It it won't be okay. You don't have to study, and and I'll say the other thing of it is, even if you don't reread Snow Crash, come anyway. Because there's so many things that are memorable about Snow Crash that we'll be discussing them. And there's and the other thing about it is Snow Crash is written in such a way that every time you read it, you you pick out new things. So even if you 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 have reread it, there's still gonna be things that you'll be you'll be seeing. Um, oh, and feel free to visit our exhibition of Snow Crash here at VWBPE. All you have to do is, you know, like just adjust your camera and look for the big platform that says Snow Crash on it. We wanted to make it really apparent. Um, the other thing is if you'd like to talk with us more, um, we are doing an immersive event also on <laughs> with the Shadowlands and redesign of play in World of Warcraft. We're doing that on the 31st. And Chris will just put up the slides with contacts really quickly. But here's what we think. In this dystopic time, we think there is an opportunity to bring up virtual worlds again. And and thank you, Zoom, for giving us the reason <laughs> the, the reason to do that. We think that there are, are affordances here that you can and, and I know you might be a little disheartened, but once again you can once again bring up two people because it does make a difference. Okay, so thanks everybody. And we'll put the links to the slides and other stuff so that. Oh my gosh, Eric, yeah, we did. That was us. <laughs> and 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 because we built we built the Tibetan Book of the Dead. <laughs> Still one of my favorite builds in second line.
<laughs> and and we we went on to build the Egyptian Book of Gates, which is the Book of the Dead. And, also, and then we did a bunch of builds on, on Dia de los Muertos. So we laugh that yeah um, that all of our build, that all of our builds in Second Life and in virtual worlds deal with death. <laughs> nice to see you here. <laughs> and I got I got to get back to that conference. I haven't been there since for a long time. It always seems to coincide with with something else. But man, I love that conference. And when we're out of the pandemic, I want to go back to it. <laughs> I hope you're okay, Edith. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody. And we'll see you guys. <laughs>